Saul was a very wise man. Because the Gemara says, chachamim Wise men exaggerate. <laughs> Excessively. Thank you so much for having me this evening. It's a true honor to be here. I want to thank uh, Saul and Roz for hosting me and for making this wonderful trip possible. Uh, it's really uh, beyond my wildest imaginations to be invited to speak in Eretz Yisrael. Can you imagine that? They invite a rabbi from America to give shir in Israel. That's like selling coal in, uh, in Newcastle, as they say, but miracles happen. I want to thank Rabbi Aaron from Yibanev for uh, enduring listening to me for the 10th time today and for making all of the arrangements possible, the Sefer Panam Yachos. And uh, I want to welcome and thank my dear friend, David Callis, who uh, we had the privilege of learning together with for many years, and we continue to learn together when he's in the States, and for helping make this trip possible as well. We wish all of our sponsors. Tonight's event is sponsor Lila Nishmas, Sara, Bas, Moshe, Moshe Aaron. And uh, we wish all the Nisham Shem and Aliyah, and it should be Uzchus for Shalema for all Chalei Yisrael. Okay, this is uh, what I consider maybe one of my most uh, sophisticated and complex shiurim, so just brace yourselves. If there's something I say that you don't quite get, or if there's a word that I use, say, Rabbi, just translate. Let's just cut straight to the chase. Here we are in Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is the center of the universe. It's the heart of the world. In fact, I read in 1967, the mayor wanted to preserve the uh, ancient charm of Yushalayim, and therefore he continued to have the, the streets of Yushalayim, so to speak, intertwined and twisted, as is the ancient character of the city. But what he didn't realize is it has to be that way, because Yushalayim is the heart of the universe. And in the heart, there are arteries, and veins that are twisted and contorted, and Yushalayim being the Leif HaOlam similarly reflects that characteristic. Interestingly, every night of the year when we dive in Marav, we conclude the final bracha, Baruch Atah Hashem, Shoimer Amoy Yisrael Lo'ad. He guards his nation forever. And interestingly, the night of Shabbos, we say as follows, take a look on your sheets, Ufroi Salina Sukkah Shalemecha. Spread upon us your canopy of peace. Baruch Atah Hashem. Ha'poyrei sukkah sholem aleinu. You spread your canopy of peace upon us. V'al kol amo Yisrael and upon all the Jewish people. V'al Yerushalayim and over Jerusalem. Sorry, I can't help myself. V'al Yerushalayim and over the city of Yerushalayim. As the Gemara says, Yerushalayim mandach hashmei. Why are we talking about Yerushalayim? Why are we saying God spreads His canopy of peace over Yushalayim? It's not Jerusalem Day. Today is Shabbos. What does Shabbos have to do with Yushalayim? Shabbos is celebrated everywhere in the world. It's not more important to keep Shabbos in Yushalayim than it is elsewhere. It is incumbent upon every Jew to keep Shabbos. Why invoke Yushalayim Lel Shabbos? We don't mention it other nights of the year. We don't say, Shemar Amo Yisrael La'ad V'al Yerushalayim during the weekday. Why invoke Yerushalayim the night of, of Shabbos? And even more interesting, if you look in Kabbalah Shabbos, you look in the which of course was written by Rav Shlomo al Kabbitz. We were just there Thursday at his uh, kever in Tzvas. So we read the L'chadoidi, which we know spells out an acrostic, L'shlomo Chazak, it says, L'chadoidi l'kras kalo p'nei Shabbos n'kabala k'amai beloved toward the bride. The bride, of course, refers to Shabbos. And we speak about the greatness, the accolades of Shabbos. Shavar v'zachar v'divarechad l'kras Shabbos l'chul v'nelcha. And then suddenly, Kabbalah Shabbos takes a very swift left turn. Mikdash melech ir melucha. Sanctum of the king, kingly city. Who are we talking to? What is the Mikdash Melech? Refers to Jerusalem, Yushalayim. We see Kumi Tzimi Toicha Hafecha arise, emerge from the being overturned. Ravlach Shevet Ve'imekavacha. Enough already in the Valley of Tears. Why are we addressing Yushalayim the night of Shabbos? Why do we request of Yushalayim to rise from the ashes? It's not 
Tisha B'Av. What does the ruin, what does the destruction of Jerusalem and the future rebuilding have to do with Kabbalah Shabbos? We continue. It's almost as if the main subject of Kabbalah Shabbos is Yerushalayim. Hisnari me'af rakumi, shake yourself off, arise from the dust. Who are we talking to? We're talking to Jerusalem. That means Jews all over the world, whether here, whether in the Galos, address Yerushalayim and say, shake yourselves off from the dust. Why do we tell Yerushalayim to shake off from the dust? We say, Hisoyri, Hisoyri, arise, arise. Who do we speak to? Again, Yerushalayim. We say, don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed. The city will be built on the mound. Why refer to Yerushalayim the night of Shabbos? What does Yerushalayim have to do with Shabbos? Okay, let's move on to another holy city in Eretz Yisrael. Let's speak a little bit about Hebron. Let's talk about Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu was commanded by God when he was an old man to have first milah, to have a circumcision. God appears to Avraham on the third day of his circumcision. Where was Abraham? He's sitting at the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day. Why does the Torah say that Hashem appeared to Avraham in the plains of Mamre? Who cares where it was? Of what significance is it? Says Rashi, no, it's very important to know where God appeared to Abraham. You know who this Mamre guy is? Mamre was the one who advised Abraham to have a bris milah. That means Abraham Avinu, so to speak, was seeking advice, asking for advice, and Mamre said, do it, do it, man, go for it. Okay, as opposed to who? Did other people not advise him? Well, we know there were three friends. Their names were Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. They were the associates of Abraham Avinu. If you look at number five, in Lechlecha, Parak Yedalev, Pasuk Chavdalev, it says Abraham Avinu had three buddies, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, Heim Yikhu Chalka. But what's very strange is there's a rule in the Torah that when you have a bunch of names, the name listed first is the most important. For example, when it comes to the spies, the Miraglam, the Ramban says they're, they're listed in order of chashivos, in order of importance. Typically, when you have a list of names, you know, uh, it's not like a, a batting order, it's not like a baseball team. In a batting order, your best player is batting third or fourth. You know, the leadoff hitter is not necessarily the best player. Not in the Torah. The name listed first is the most important. So look at the order here. Aner, <coughs> Eshkol, Mamre. Aner, Eshkol, Mamre. Wait a second, why is Mamre listed last if he's the good one? He's the one who advised Avraham to have a bris milah. In the Medrash, the Medrash tells us that Aner told Avraham, are you nuts? You're 100 years old, you're going to have a circumcision? Eshkol says, you're weakening yourself to your enemies. If your enemies find out that you're in a state of circumcision, they're going to attack. So think about what's happening. There are three friends. There's Aner, there's Eshkol, there's Mamre. Aner said, don't do it. Eshkol said, don't do it. Mamre says, do it. Why is Mamre listed last? Isn't he the most important? Isn't he on the highest level? Isn't he, should he be leading off the list? Okay, enough about Hebron. Let's move on to another city. Let's talk about the city of Tzfas. We were just there. And if you've ever been into Tzfas, we know it. Tzfas is the, uh, the mystical city, the Kabbalistic city. They're building a, a new library there, a collection of all the uh, sefarim and manuscripts of the sages of Tzfas throughout the ages, beginning with Arizal, Alshech, Ramach, Mabit, Bas Ayin. Many, many mikubalim throughout the ages have been drawn to Tzfas. What is it about Tzfas? It wasn't always painted blue. No, that's an after. What is it about Tzfas? What makes it the mystical city? And the Kabbalists write, most notably, there's a Sefer Chesed Li Avram. Chesed Li Avram is Rabbi Avram Azulai. Rabbi Avram Azulai was the grandfather of the Chida, Rabbi Chaim Yosef David Azulai, who in 1960, Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu brought him over from Leghorn, from Livorno, Italy. He's buried now on Harmanuchais. We happen to have been there this morning. Yeah, we made our rounds. So, 
The grandfather of the Chida, Rabbi Avraham Azulai, writes an incredible thing. He says, if you take a look, that the word Tzfas, the Misparkata, what's Misparkata? That's a system of gematria, a system of numerical value, where if a uh, letter, let's say Mem, is 40, you just take the first numeral, so it's 4. Or Kuf, which is 100, you just take the first numeral, 1. So the word Tzfas, Sadi is 99, Pei is 80, 8, Taf is 400, 4. That's 9, 8, and 4 is what? 21. With the word itself, there's another system called Imakailal, with the word itself, 22. Tzfas corresponds to all 22 letters of the Aleph base. Okay, so you're not convinced yet. Says the Chesed Avram, Lirmois, to allude on the third line, number 8. Shed Tzfas, Muchedes, Umizumenes, that Tzfas is more predisposed and inclined to appreciate the secrets of Tyra. In other words, if you are a Kabbalist, or an aspiring Kabbalist, or if you moonlight as a Kabbalist, or if you dabble in Kabbalah, and you're looking for a good city to live in, to be able to fully probe the depths the death of uh, Kabbalistic secrets, you need to live in Tzvaz. Why? Ein avir zach v'chol eretz yisro kavir tzvaz. There is nowhere where the air is pure, says the Chesed Avram. In fact, the air there is so pure that one who passes away in Tzvas, their soul goes to Gan Eden much quicker. The upshot is that there is no city in the world, and there's no city in the land of Israel, that is more misugal, which is more uh, predisposed to be able to learn Kabbalah than the city of Tzvas. And comes a chassam cipher, one of the greatest all time of the Achreinim, and in a famous responsa in Yaradeh Asim and Reish Lamed Gimel, in a famous tshuva he wrote to Rabbi Ephraim Zalman Margolios, he said, what in the world is a chassam that I'm talking about? How can you say that Tzfas is in any way greater than Jerusalem, than, than Yushalayim? Tzfas is holier than Yushalayim? Tzfas is more sanctified than Yushalayim? Yushalayim is the gateway to heaven. Avram Avinu was not uh, sacrificing Isaac in Tzfas. Nothing was going on in Tzfas. Adam Arisha was not born and created from Tzfas. Why would the Chesed Avram say that the Tzfas is most misugal to, to, um, to delve into the depths and the secrets of Torah? If that was the case, if the Chesed Avram was right, then it would come out that if somebody would come to Yushalayim, they would have to tear their garments in mourning, and when they come to Tzvas, they would have to tear again, because Tzvas is even holier. But that's not the case, and that's not true. We know that if you come to Yushalayim, you tear, and that's it. Nothing surpasses the sanctity of Yushalayim. Therefore, says the Chesam Soifer, we must conclude that when the Chesed Avram says, there is no city in the world more prone to learn Kabbalah he must have meant besides Yerushalayim, because there's no way he would ever give a adifos, a superiority, an advantage of tzvas over Yerushalayim. He must mean besides Yerushalayim. But that's not what he says. He seems to say that in fact tzvas is the most misugal city to probe the Kabbalah. He doesn't say besides Yerushalayim. Why would that be then? How could that be? Is there any basis to say, in fact, that yes, maybe there is an advantage that the city of Tzfas has? Okay, so we spoke about a number of cities. We spoke about Yerushalayim, connection to Shabbos. What is the connection? We spoke about Mamre advising Avraham Avinu. Why was Mamre the one who advised Avraham Avinu? He's not even ranked number one. We spoke about the city of Tzfas. So these are three very interesting questions, and every good shir has to answer questions with more questions. So the answer to these questions lies in asking, ready for this? I know it's a long day. We're going to ask another six questions. And the good news is there's only one answer to everything. All right? So I should go for it, huh? Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about Yehoshua ben Oh, one more city. I forgot, one more city. There's a city in Israel, you ready for the city? And I'm not talking about the one in upstate New York in the Catskills, it's called Goshen. 
right? The famous city in Israel. I say, what are you talking about, Rabbi? What do you know Israel from America? You, you, you were born in Brooklyn. No, let, let me tell you. In Yehoshua, Parak Yod Pasuk Memah, take a look at number 10. Vayakim Yehoshua, Yeshua smote the enemy. Mi Kadosh Barnea, Viyad Azza. Now, Kadosh Barnea, it's in Israel. Viyad Azza, in Israel. The is Kaler, it's Goshen, Viyad Givon. Givon's in Israel, so guess where Goshen is? It's also in Israel, clearly. Parak Yod Aleph, Pasuk Tezayin, look at number 11. Vayikach Yehoshua, it's Kal Ha'aretz Hazois. Yeshua took the whole land. Hahar, the mountain is called Negev, the south. The is called Eretz HaGoshen. The is HaRava, Har Yisrael. I mean, it's talking about what he conquered in Eretz Yisrael. Clearly, Goshen is a city in Eretz Yisrael. Look at number 12. The Goshen, the Chalon, the Gilo. Orem, Achas, Ezrachem. Clearly, three times, the Navi speaks about Goshen, each time making it crystal clear, Goshen is in Israel. There's only one problem, friends. That if you look in the Chumash, in Parshish Vayeshev, when the Jews go down to Egypt, the Pasuk says, Vayeshev Yisrael, Vieretz Mitzrayim, Vieretz Goshen. The Jews went to Egypt, into the land of Goshen. So clearly Goshen is not in Israel. So what's going on here? So the Radak immediately says, Come on, you're going to fall for that? The Radak says, Ein Zeshel Mitzrayim. There are two Goshens. One's in Israel, and one's in Egypt. That's always the easy way out. But then the Radak in Parakir Aleph says, no, that's not quite the Pshat. You know what Goshen is? It's like no man's land. What happens is, Egypt juts out and protrudes into Israel, and the, the country of Israel surrounds Goshen. So where is Goshen? Is it part of Israel? Is it part of Mitzrayim? The answer is yes. It's sort of in Israel, because it's surrounded by Israel, but it's actually part of Egypt. So it's like this no man's land. It's unclear. It's unchartered territory. Yeshua conquered it, but back in the day when the Jews went down to Egypt, it was part of Egypt. It protruded into Eretz Yisrael, and it was swallowed and absorbed in Eretz Yisrael, but it was officially part of Egypt, and then we just conquered it. Interesting. The only city in Israel Apparently, that in biblical times was part of Israel, was not part of Israel, was part of Egypt, was not. How do we account for this? What, what is the meaning of Goshen? Why was it jutting out? And how was it ultimately absorbed? Okay, look at number 17. Okay, true or false? Yes or no? Ready to take a poll? When Yoshua came into Eretz Yisrael, A, he had an easy time conquering the land, B, he had a hard time conquering the land. Easy. Easy. There were barely any casualties. You can count on your... It was, it was a piece of cake, basically. There's only one city he had a hard time conquering. What's the name of that city? Take a look at number 17, Parak Tesvav, Pasuk Tesvav. Vayal Mishon al Yoshe Devir. They arose from there to the inhabitants of Devir. Oh, you never heard of Devir? I know why. Vishem Devir Lefanim Kiryat Sefer. The name of Devir used to be Kiryat Sefer. Who ever heard of Kiryat Sefer? What? Kiryat Sefer, but it's not, they can't call it that anymore now. It's called what? Modiyan Elite? I don't know the whole thing, right? You're asking the wrong guy. But the Kiryat Sefer today is not biblical Kiryat Sefer. That's why they're not allowed to call it Kiryat Sefer. That's my understanding. But the, the Navi says, they came to Devir. Oh, you don't know where, where Devir is? That's the city that used to be called Kiryat Sefer. Fine. So it's giving me the name of what the, the city used to be called. And they couldn't conquer it. By Yomer Kalev, Asher Yakez Kiryat Sefer. Whoever conquers Kiryat Sefer, Ulechada, and captures it. So already you have a double language, Yake and Lechada. What's that for? Also, Kale, you got it wrong. Why did you say whoever conquers Kiryat Sefer? That's not the name of the city. The city is Devir. It used to be called Kiryat Sefer. Kale, get with the program, Kale. That was the old name of the city. So Kale put up signs, whoever conquers Kiryat Sefer, what's the reward? Venosati loyas achsa viti isha. I will give them achsa, my daughter, as a wife. So let's get what's going on here. There was a city in Eretz Yisrael they couldn't conquer. Question number one, why? 
Why is this the only city in Israel they couldn't conquer? Question number two, why does Caliph say, Yaka and Lechada? Number three, if the city's name used to be called Kiryat Sefer, why is Kalev calling it Kiryat Sefer? It should say, Vayoyimer Kalev Asher Yake Devir. Devir is the current name of the city. Why does he refer to the old name of the city? And what's Kalev thinking? I mean, is that a good idea? You have a daughter. Now, it could be the guy who's going to conquer Kiryat Sefer is a really nice guy. Could be he's a terrific guy. But is that for sure the person that you want to just give your daughter to? The guy who blows up Kiryat Sefer and conquers it? Ah, oh, he's the right guy for my daughter? Why was Kalev so sure that whoever conquers Kiryat Sefer will get Achsa, will be given Achsa, his daughter, as a wife? And who conquers Kiryat Sefer? Vayotada Asniel ben Kenaz. A man by the name of Asniel ben Kenaz conquers it. Achi Kalev, Kalev's brother. You know, luckily he kept it in the family. Vayitenloi as Achsa Vitai Isha, and he gave him Achsa, his daughter, as a wife. Interesting. Comes the Gemara Masechta Tmura, Adaf Tazayin. And the Gemara says it got the whole story wrong, and that's not what happened. Kalev never made an announcement whoever conquers Kiryat Sefer will be given Achsa, my daughter. You know what happened? What happened was, as Moshe Rabbein was number 18, it was about to die. Moshe says to Yeshua, Yeshua, last chance. Ask me anything you want. So Yeshua says, oh, we think I've been doing for the last 40 years. I've been sitting by your feet. I've been serving you. Yeshua would come, set up the Beis HaMedrash. Yeshua was the faithful attendant of Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeshua says, I have no questions. Whatever I wanted to ask you, I've asked you over the last 40 years. God was unhappy with Yeshua's response, as if Yeshua already knew everything. Says the Gemara at that moment, Yoshua forgot 300 halachos. And he had an additional 700 halachic questions. And guess what the people wanted to do to Yoshua? They came to Yeshua and said, Yeshua, you're worthless. I mean, what's the job of a rabbi? Rabbi's not a social director. Rabbi's a Talmud Chacham. You don't know the Torah? They wanted to kill him, the Gemara says. So Yeshua said to God, uh, God, this is not a good, good situation. So Hashem says, what do you want me to do? Tell you the halachas? Can't tell it to you. Go distract them. Go tell them we're conquering Israel. We have to be busy in war. So Yeshua said, uh, guys, hey, relax. We don't have time for the learning now. We're going to go conquer Israel. We'll deal with my uh, lack of knowledge later. That's the story. So in fact, the Gemara says, they didn't have a hard time conquering Kiryat Sefer. In fact, there is no place, Kiryat Sefer. What happened was, they forgot 300 halachos. And Kalev said, whoever conquers Kiryat Sefer, i.e. meaning, whoever reminds us of the 300 halachos that were forgotten when Moshe Rabbeinu died, I will give them my daughter Achsa as a wife. Asniel ben Kenaz was able to remind them the 300 halachos. So listen to what's going on. You have what the Navi says, and you have what the Gemara says, and they seem to be at odds. The Navi says, there's a military story here. They had a hard time conquering a city, they couldn't conquer it. So Kalev makes an announcement, whoever conquers the city, here's my daughter. And Asniel ben Kenaz conquers the city of Kiryat Sefer. That's what the Navi says. Come, Chazal, and the Gemara, the Gemara says, that's not what happened. What happened was, when Yoshua took over for Moshe, he forgot 300 halachas. And people were devastated. So Kalev came and said, whoever reminds us of 300 halachos, here is Achsa as a wife. <coughs> and Osniel ben Kenaz reminded them the halachos. So the question is, friends, how could the Pasuk be at so disparate with what the Gemara says? How could they be so diametrically different? Here the Navi says one story and the Gemara says a different story. How do you reconcile this? By the way, these are all the questions of the Sefer Arve Nachal. Arve Nachal was written by Rav David Ibishitz. No relation to Rav Yonis and Ibishitz. He is the author of Levushe Surad on Shulchan Aruch. So if you open up any Shulchan Aruch, so the main commentary on Arachayim is the Magin Avram. On the Magin Avram, you have a super commentary called Levushe Surad. The Levushe Surad wrote the Sefer Arve Nachal. The Arve Nachal 
is buried in Svas, right next to the Bas Ayin, in a cave. <coughs> we were also there. Okay. What's going on over here? So the following idea, which is real, really the heart and soul of tonight's shir, comes from many sources say the same idea. And it comes from Rav Pinchas Karatzer, one of the original Bale Hasidos. Comes from the Devere Yecheskel, comes from the Arve Nachal, it comes from Rav Levi Yitzhak of Ardichev. And the idea goes as follows. One more question. <laughs> so I think we're up to something like eight, though or nine. We'll answer them all, don't worry. Sefer Yehoshua, look at number 20. Vayishlochem Yehoshua. Yehoshua sent them out. Vayelchu el Hamarav, he went to the ambush. Vayeshvu bein Basil or bein Ai, he settled between Basil and Ai, miyam la'ai, west of Ai. Vayolon Yehoshua balaylo hahu, he slept on that night. Okay, he slept on that night. As opposed to what? What do you want him to do? Stay up all night? Is it really that noteworthy that we need to uh, record for all posterity that that night Yehoshua slept? I would also like to sleep. Everyone wants to sleep. Everyone sleeps every night. Oh, what's, the, what's the number what's the saying? So the Gemara says, no, Vayolan Shom Yehoshua meant Shalon. Look at number 21, the Gemara Megillah, the Oymka Shel Halacha. He delved. Lon means to lodge. To sleep meaning to dig deep down into the halacha. Basically, what was Yehoshua doing the night before the battle? He was learning Tyra. What do you call a general who the night before a big battle is learning Tyra? Negligent. <laughs> Why is Yehoshua learning the night before the battle? Why is he not strategizing? Why is he not preparing? Comes the Imre Pinchas, number 22, the Rey Yechezka, number 23, Arve Nachal, Rabbi Yitzhak Tuchev, and this is all based on the idea of the Magid of Nazrich. And the idea is that we know God created the world with the Torah. God looked into the Torah and He created the world. The Torah is the blueprint of the world, the architectural plan of the world. Just give you an example. Many commentaries wonder, one of the most important concepts in Judaism, Olam Haba, the world to come. Guess how many times the Chumash talks about Olam Haba? Zero. Doesn't talk about Olam Haba. What's it, why is it not in the Chumash? Oh, Rav Aaron Cutler says very simply, the Chumash is the architectural plans of the universe. Whatever is in the open text will be in the open reality. God doesn't want anyone to see Olam Haba, the, the says it to Hillam. Ayin loiroasa elekim zulasecha. Nobody can see Olam Haba. If it would be in the architectural plans, the open Chumash, it would be apparent to the eye. God doesn't want Olam Haba to be apparent to the eye. Therefore, He omitted it from the architectural plans. The same way, if there's no playroom in the architectural plans, it won't be in the building. If Olam Haba is not in the outright architectural plans of the universe, it will not be in the open reality. Certainly it exists. It exists in a certain hidden reality. It's Ayin Loira, Salah Kim Zulah but be it as it may, God created the world with the Torah. But more than the whole world, there is a very strong connection between the Torah and Eretz Yisrael. In fact, if we could give an analogy, we could say that a Sefer Torah, Mishnayis, Shas, is spread out all over Israel. Each part of Torah corresponds to a different city, area, region of Eretz Yisrael. Each city has a specific miktsoya, a specific area of Torah that it is connected to. And the way that city or area is conquered is by learning and mastering that part of Torah, you then are able to gain control over that part of Eretz Yisrael. The night before a battle, what do you think Yehoshua was learning, says the Mahdud? Yehoshua, in his great wisdom, was privy to which part of Torah corresponds to that particular city. And therefore, what Yoshua did was, he went into Jericho, he went to Yericho, the night before, he learned the area of Torah that corresponds to Yericho. Once he mastered that, the walls crumbled. And then he comes to the city of Ai, and Ai is captured. And that is why Yoshua had a very easy time conquering Eretz Yisrael. So why did he have a hard, so, such a hard time when he got to carry out Sefer? Oh, 
The answer is, what chilek of Torah do you think corresponded to the city of Kiryat Sefer? <coughs> this is where the words of the Navi and the words of the Gemara fit together like a glove. It's the same thing. You know why Yehoshua had a difficult time conquering Kiryat Sefer? Because the portion of Torah that corresponded to Kiryat Sefer were the 300 halachas that were forgotten during the morning of Moshe. And because they forgot those 300 halachas, there was no way to conquer the city. It was impenetrable. How are you going to conquer the city if the architectural plans and the guidebook and the manual is not within reach? And therefore, Kalev said one thing, which is two things. Whoever reminds us of the 300 halachos will thereby conquer Kiryat Sefer, and that's the guy I'm going to give Achsa, my daughter, as a wife. So it's not that the Navi is saying one thing and the Gemara is saying something else. The Gemara is telling you the behind the scenes. Kalev says whoever conquers the city. How are you going to conquer the city? You have to master that specific area of Torah that corresponds to the city of Kiryat Sefer. And if you look carefully at the Pasuk, it reads like a glove. We asked, why does it say, the she- it says the name of the city previously was Kiryat Sefer. Why did Kalev say, whoever smites Kiryat Sefer? He should say, whoever smites Devir. Because we translated the word wrong. We translated the word lefanim as previously. Is that what lefanim means? What does lefanim mean in Lashon HaKodesh? Lefanim, penim. What does penim mean? On the inside. The name of the city is Devir. Of course that's the name of the city. But what is the internal mechanism of the city? What is the inside of the city? The name of the city of Devir on the inside is Kiryat Sefer, meaning if you want to really conquer it, get to the root of the matter, you have to master the Kiryat Sefer, the 300 halachas. So therefore, Kalev was a smart man. He knew that if he's going to ask someone merely to conquer Devir, it's going to be just, you know, grasping at straws. He said, I need someone to get to the root of the matter. Kiryat Sefer that's the guy for my daughter. And Asniel ben Kanaz restored and reminded them the 300 halachas, and Memela, and it just happened naturally, thereby, that he was able to conquer the city of Kiryatsi. At this point in the shir, it becomes apparent why the Gemara says, and in the times of the first Beis HaMikdash, the Navi says, of the Haaretz. Why was the land of Israel lost? Remember this Gemara, Gemara about Matziah, that Behei. Why was the land of Ad? Why was the land destroyed? And the Gemara says, Al Azva Mes Tairasi. They forsook the Torah. What's one thing got to do with the other? Because they forsook the Torah, the <coughs> land was destroyed. Why the land? Why not the people? The answer is, the land of Israel is intertwined to the observance of the Torah. The way the land is maintained and secured is when each part of the Torah is mastered, observed, and learned by the Jewish people, that is what gives security to the land. That's what maintains the land. When they forsook the Torah, when the Navi Yermia says, al azvam has that's why the, of the Haaretz, but the Gemara and Gittin says on the flip side, Eretz Yisrael is an Eretz Tzvi. It's a land that expands. Why does Israel expand? The more Torah that is learned, the more it is observed, the more Sfarim, we walk to Meishon today, it's a kiyom of the words of Koheles, Asoy Sfarim Harve Ein Kates, the number of uh, Sfarim that come out on an hourly basis in the land of it, it's, it's incredible. The land literally expands. So at this point in the Shira, we come to un- uncharted territory. So we have the general concept. The general concept is that each part of the Torah corresponds to a different city and region in Israel. If we would only know what part of the Torah corresponds to which city, we may have an easier time maintaining control over the land. But we are not privy to that information. But nevertheless, 
There's a concept, Tairahi, the Lomite on the Tzarech. Let's try our best to determine. So what parts of the Torah correspond to what? <coughs> and this is really an approach which was originated based on, on the idea that we mentioned by Rabbi Moshe Wolfson. <coughs> Rabbi Moshe Wolfson is the Mashkiach today in Yeshiva Tarbadas, and one of the great thinkers of our time. He wrote uh, Svarim, three volumes, Amunas Itacha, and he actually has a, a magnificent small sefer called Tzion V'Areha, Tzion and Her Cities. And it's basically based on this concept where he delves and tries to figure out which part of the Torah, in fact, corresponds to what part of Eretz Yisrael. So let's begin with Rachel Imenu. Where is Rachel Imenu buried? Rachel is buried in base. Lechem Yehuda. What's she doing there? I mean, so Yaakov Inu says, don't hold it against me that I left her on the road and I'd even bring her to a decent burial. I mean, what's Rachel doing there? So you don't want to bury her in, uh, in uh, Maras HaMachpelah? There's something wrong with Har Zesen. There's something wrong with Har Is There's something wrong with Eretz Chayim. I don't know what. Sanhedria. A lot of places here. Why is Yaakov you know, dumping Rachel? Basically, Rashi says that Yaakov told Yosef, I didn't even give her the decency, decency of bringing her off the road. No, she's buried in Beis Lechem Yehuda. So let's try to delve into what is the part of Torah that corresponds to Beis Lechem Yehuda. Who was born in Beis Lechem Yehuda? We say in Kabbalah Shabbos, Al Yad ben Yishai Beis Halachmi. Who was born in Beis Lechem Yehuda? Mashiach, David. Why was he born there? A lot of wonderful cities in Israel. He could have been. Why was he born in Beis Lechem Yehuda? How do we know if someone is Mashiach? You know, do they carry like a, a card member? You no, know, imagine a guy comes in. So in America, people come in from Israel all the time. You know, uh, they come into the shul. They think in the five towns, everybody. So they come into the shul. They say, Rabbi, I live in Yerushalayim. I have 10 kids. I have to marry off my fifth kid. Okay, we're see what we can do. And by the way, I'm a Shiach. So maybe, how do I know if the guy is telling the truth? How do you know if a guy comes into the Shul and says, by the way, I'm a Shiach. How do you know if you're a Shiach? So the Ramam says there are certain, uh, certain parameters or certain ways to determine if someone, in fact, is a Shiach. The Ramam writes, look at number 31. Im asa v'hitzliach. If... Mashiach is successful. Ubana beis hamikdash, the kibbutz nidche Yisrael, and he gathers the ingatherings of the Jewish people. He's Mashiach, meaning if you want to know if someone's Mashiach, if he gathers the Jewish people to Eretz Yisrael, if he gets all the people in Brooklyn and New York to come to Eretz Yisrael, and some people in California, maybe in Canada also, then we got something going. That's how we know someone's Mashiach. If he's mekabitz nidche amoy Yisrael. Where is Mashiach born? Beis Lechem. That means Beis Lechem is the location that from there comes the Koyach of gathering in the exiles. That's where Mashiach comes from. Is there any wonder then that Rachel Imenu is buried there? What is the great promise to Rachel Imenu? V'yesh tikva l'acharisech no'om Hashem v'shavu v'anim l'gvula The promise to Rachel is she will be privy and she will contribute to the return of the Jewish people to Eretz Yisrael. There's no wonder then that she's buried in Beis Lechem Yehuda, the place of Mashiach. That is the central job of Mashiach. So we have Rochel Imenu, the Veshavu Banim Levulam in Beis Lechem. We have Mashiach who will gather in the exiles in Beis Lechem Yehuda. Which mitzvah in the Torah then? is the mitzvah that brings the Jews back to their ancestral land. That's the mitzvah of Yoival. What does it say? Look at number 30. What's the mitzvah of Yoival? In the 50th year, in the Jubilee year, if somebody sold land in Israel, the owner of the land returns to the land. Bishnas ha-yoival azois, toshuvu yishalachuz asoi. In the Jubilee year, every Jew returns to his ancestral land. That means the mitzvah of Yoival is the mitzvah that Jews return to the land. So what part of the Torah then is connected to Beis Lechem? Yoival. Beis Lechem Yehuda corresponds to the part of Torah of Yoival. Get a load of this. 
What does God tell Rachel? Noam Hashem v'shavu banim l'gvulam. You take the the Rashi Tevais. Look at number thirty-two. Hashem yud v'shavu vav banim beis l'gvulam lamer. What does that spell out? Yaivel. Because the mitzvah of the Torah that corresponds to Beis Lechem Yehuda, the birthplace of Mashiach, the place where Rachel is buried, is the mitzvah of Yoivel, the mitzvah of return to the land. Is there any wonder then that Mashiach is born there? Is there any wonder then that the Hashkocha has it that when the nations of the world would like to imitate our Messiah and they claim they have the Messiah, where do they say their Messiah is from? Bethlehem, why do you think that is so? Because Mashiach can only come from one place. It could, if the job of Mashiach is to return the people to the land, Beis Lechem is the only place. That's what Rachel is doing there. So Boyaz lives with Rus. And they produce Oyved. Amazingly, what does Naomi, what is Naomi told when the child is born? To Bayaz and Rus. What do they say? Look at number 36. The neighbors call it a name. You know what they say? Yulad, Bain, Lenami. Yulad, Bain, Lenami. Rashi Tevais. Yud, Bez, Lamid. Yodel. Why are they, they mentioning Yodel? Because this is Malchus Beistavah. This is where Mashiach is coming from. Mashiach is the great gatherer of the Jewish people. Yoivel is the mitzvah. In other words, the mitzvah of the Torah that corresponds to Beis Lechem Yehuda. Beis Lechem Yehuda, Roshi Tevis. Yoivel. Beis Lamed Yud. Rearrange it. Yoivel. The mitzvah of the Torah that corresponds to Beis Lechem, where Rachel Emenu is buried, is Yoivel. By the way, David, Mashiach, is born on which day? Shavuos is day 50, the 50th day, the day of Yavya. What carbon do we bring on Shavuos? Beis Lechem. Beis Lechem. The two loaves. Is it any wonder then that why do you think Rus came from Maya? Listen to this. Rus came from Mayav, and then she converted. Mayav is numerical value, Mem, Vav, Aleph, Vez, 49. She ain't there yet, she's almost at Yoimah. But then when she converts, Yulad Ben Manami, she raises up to the 50th level, and now she's ready to produce Mashiach. What is the job of Mashiach? Mikabet Nidche Amo Yisrael. Who arranges the whole thing? Nami! Nami! Rashi Tevois, Mekabetz, Nidche, Amoy, Yisrael. Incredible. Nami is Rashi Tevois. You have to rearrange it. Mekabetz, Nidche, Amoy, Yisrael. So if you want to know what part of the Torah corresponds to Beis Lecha, the Mitzvah of Yoibam. Okay, so now that's a little flavor. Let's move on to the city of Hebron. Very interesting. Abraham Avinu is told about the mitzvah of bris milah. And in the context of the mitzvah of bris milah, take a look at number 40. This is very interesting. Hashem promises him, by the way, Abraham, get a bris. I will make you great. The ma'imai, you will multiply greatly. I'll make your nations. Kings will come from you. Interesting. Hashem tells Abraham in the context of the command to do bris milah that kings will come from you. What's that got to do with bris milah? Just say have a circumcision. Why is Hashem mentioning the concept uh, that he will be a king? Well, it's pointed out what kings came from Abraham Abinu? David. Where did David take his power? Where was he anointed? David was anointed. If you look in the Navi, I right, take a look. We're moving right along. We'll try to wrap it up um, soon. David was anointed. Look at number 43. That the men of Yehuda said, Where should we anoint David? And Hashem said, Go up to the Ari Yehuda. Where? Go to Hebron. 
Where was David anointed? In Hebron. Where was Abraham <coughs> promised that kings would come from him? Hebron. If you take a look, look at him 42 for a minute. Right before Hashem told Abraham to have a bris milah, kings would come from him, Abraham was all over the place in Eretz Yisrael. He went to the north, to the south, all he went down to Egypt. And then he goes to Hebron and Hashem says, Hey, Abraham, have a circumcision and kings will come from you. Why did Hashem wait until Abraham went to Hebron and only then said, Have bris milah and then kings will come from you? Apparently, Hebron is connected to Malchus. That's where David was anointed by the tribe of Yehuda, by the ten tribes. When Avshalom wanted to usurp the Malchus, where does Avshalom go to become king? Hebron. Hebron is a place of kings. Interesting. When Abraham Avinu goes to Ma'aras Hamachpelah, what do they tell Abraham? What do the Bnei the Ephraim, the, um, the Bnei Ches tell Abraham? Nesi Eloi Kim Ata Vesecheinu, you're a king. What are you is a king for? Hebron is the place where kings are anointed. It's a place of Malchus. David, Avshalom, Avraham. Let me just give you a little more of a flavor. When Avraham bought the Ma'aras HaMashpelah, the Pasuk says, Vayakam Sude Avraham. Avraham's field rose up. What does that mean? It lifted up. Rashi says, listen carefully to the words of Rashi. The field had an elevation. It left the hands of a hediot. What's a hediot? A simpleton. Liyad Melech! And it went into the hands of a king! Why in the context of Abraham buying the Ma'ara Salach Pela is he referred to as a king? The answer is the of Malachim. And when Abraham is in Hebron, he is called in the sea Alekim. The field is having an elevation. It's going into the hands of a king. That's where... David was anointed, that's where Avshalom tried to usurp the Malchus. Is there any wonder, it's pointed out in a very interesting sefer, Neflai Svitar Hashem, that Hashem orchestrated to promise Avraham that kings will come from you. He made sure to tell Avraham that in Hebron, so that the wood of Hebron and the stones of Hebron and the beams of Hebron would be able to see later on, 837 years later, the fruition of that prophecy. There in that place, and by the way, from here we see a very interesting principle that if God gives a prophecy, it comes to fruition in the exact same place where the prophecy is said. Meaning, not only if Hashem says something is going to happen, will it happen? It will happen in the place that it's prophesied. But why is Abraham promised to be the progenitor of kings in Hebron? Why in the context of bris milah? Tell you an incredible Zayar Kadosh, okay? The Zayar says that when the brothers encountered Yosef, they said, what? You're Yosef? So he says, come, come close. Vayat Yishloi, what does Rashi say? He showed them that he had bris milah. So what's the exchange over here? What's going on over here? The Zayar says, Now what the brothers couldn't understand is, why are you king? How did you become a melech? Why do you deserve this? And the answer the Zaira says, that in the merit of preserving the sanctity of the ois bris kodesh, of bris milah, one merits malchus. The proof is Yosef. Yosef said, you know why I'm the king? Because I guarded myself. When Aishas Potifera tried to tempt me, I ran away. I preserved Kedusha Sabris. Therefore, I'm a Melech today. I ruled over my desires and now I rule over Egypt. The proof is, says Isaiah, the night Rus came to lie by Boaz. He was tempted. But he said, No, I'm not touching you. Shikhli ala Baker. And he overcame his temptations. And Hashem said, Oh, you're like Yosef Atzadik. Kings are coming from you, pal. Yosef was zocha to uh, Malucha. Boyaz was zocha to Malucha because they guarded the bris. Therefore, Hashem says to Avraham in the context of bris milah, you keep this, melachim mimcha yitzayu, kings are going to come from you. <clears throat> Which mitzvah in the Torah corresponds to Hebron? Bris milah. That's why God told Avraham about the bris in Hebron. That's why all kings 
were anointed in Hebron. Because Hebron is a city of bris milah, and the merit of preserving the bris, one is Zohar to Melucha. Hebron is a city of bris milah. So now let's just tweak the idea. If each part of the Torah corresponds to a different city in Eretz Yisrael, and the way you maintain possession of that city is by mastering that chilek of Torah, it works both ways. That means if somebody lives in a certain part of Eretz Yisrael, they will have a stronger connection to the particular mitzvah that's associated with that city. Therefore, do you know why Mamre advised Avraham to have the bris milah? He wasn't any better than Aner or Eshko. They're all equal. Maybe he was even worse. He just happened to be the lucky beneficiary of living in Hebron. He was a Wayne Mamre. He owned Hebron. You own Hebron. You have mastery over Brismila. You appreciate Brismila. You're going to be the one to tell Abraham, Abraham, go for it. It's not that he was greater. It's that he lived in Hebron. If you live in Hebron, you are attached. You are connected specifically to the mitzvah of Brismila. Let's talk for a moment about the city of Tzfas. Could it be then, can we suggest humbly, that what part of Torah corresponds to the city of Tzfas? It almost has got to be the secrets of the Torah, the Kabbalah. In other words, which part of Torah is the Torah associated and connected to the city of Tzfas? It's the mysteries and the, the, the Kabbalah of the Torah, the Sodos of the Torah, the secrets of the Torah. And if you want to understand the secrets, you can have a better shot in Tzfas. And if you live in Tzfas, you'll have a better shot understanding the secrets. It's not that Tzfas is holier than Yushalayim. It's not on a higher level than Yushalayim. It just happens to be the beneficiary of being associated with that particular chilek of Torah. Doesn't mean it's greater than Yushalayim. If I ask you, there are different parts of the body. What's more important, the heart or the eyes? Yes, they're both very important but you cannot live without the heart. Oh, I have both. What are you? So the heart is more important. Does that mean the heart could see? The heart can't see, but it's still more important than the eyes. It's just the central organ. Tzfas is a holy city. It's not as holy as Yushalayim. It is the particularly connected specifically to that branch of Torah wisdom. Okay, we're almost there. Let's talk about Goshen. What in the world is Goshen? So it's interesting. Goshen is like part of Israel. It's not part of Israel. It juts out of Mitzrayim, but it's absorbed into Israel. You know, there's 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. How many mitzvahs do Rabbanon? Seven. A total of 620. If you count the letters in the Aser Sadebrois, how many letters in the Aser Sadebrois? The Balaturim says there's 620 letters in the Aser Sadebrois. 613 until the final seven letters, Asher L'Reyecha. The first 613 letters correspond to the 613 mitzvahs, the Eireisa, the mitzvahs. The seven last letters, Asher L'Reyecha, your friends, your friends are the rabbis, they're trying to help you. They enacted mitzvahs as safeguards. The last seven letters of al Turim says corresponds to the Sheva Mitzvah's Rabbana. In fact, the Chassam Sofer writes, Remez, Asher L'Reyecha. You know what the Sheva Mitzvah's Rabbana are? Aleph is Avelos. Shin is Simchas Chassam Rekala. Sheva Brachos. Reish is Rechitza Netilas Yadayim. Lamed is Lechem Hasakom. Reish, Rishuyos Eruvim. Ayin is Amolek, and the last Esther, and the final Chaf refers to Chanukah. The last Mitzvah of Rabbanon is Chanukah. Suggest with Moshe Wolfson. So you have 613 Mitzvahs. Each Mitzvah corresponds to a different part of Eretz Yisrael. Well, what corresponds to the seven Mitzvahs of Rabbanon? Are the Rabbanons the Eraisa? Are they part of the Torah? Well, we have to observe them. But they're not Dairaisa. The city of Goshen corresponds to the mitzvahs Drabanan. What's the final mitzvah Drabanan? Chanukah. Is there any wonder then that Goshen is introduced in Parshas Vayigash, the Parsha of Chanukah? Goshna is Rashi Tevois, Hey Gimel Nun and Shem. At least it works in Chutzlarns. <laughs> 
So by now, let's see if we can figure out the grand finale. So the part of Torah that corresponds to Beis Lechem is the mitzvah of Yoibel. The part of Torah that corresponds to Hebron is Bris Milah. The part of Torah that corresponds to Tzfas are the secrets of Torah. The seven mitzvahs of Rabbanon correspond to Goshen. So what is the mitzvah of Yerushalayim? Which part of Torah corresponds to Yerushalayim? We know we have 12 months a year. Each month is given to a different Shevet. Shabbos, though, is not given to any specific Shevet. Shabbos is the heritage of Yaakov Avinu, Ve'ha'achal Ticha, Nachlas Yaakov Avicha. The Gemara says, Kal HaMesane Gala Shabbos, anyone who delights in the Shabbos. Nois Nenloi Nachal Obalim Tzarem, they give him unending boundaries. Shenemar, Oz Tesane Gala Hashem. Ve'her Kav Ticha Obama Se'eretz, Ve'ha'achal Ticha Nachlas Yaakov Avicha, Ki Pi Hashem Dida. Shabbos is not divided. It belongs to Yaakov, to all of Klai Yisrael. Let's look at Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael is divided among the Shvatim, the 12 Shvatim, except for one part of Eretz Yisrael. Yerushalayim, the Gemara says, just like Shabbos. So what mitzvah in the Torah do you think is the mitzvah of Yerushalayim? Yerushalayim in place is what Shabbos is in time. There's a concept in the Sefer HaYetzira called Ashan, smoke. It's like this. Olam, Shana, Nefesh. That what there is in place, there is in time, there is in person. And they converge. For example, place, the holiest place on earth is called the Shachadoshim. The holiest day is Yom Kippur. The holiest person is Yom Kippur, is Kohen Gadol. They all converge on Yom Kippur in the Kodesh HaKadosh and by the Kohen Gadol. What Yerushalayim is as a place, Shabbos is as a day. So when the great day of Shabbos comes, we specifically say, yes, Shabbos is the day of the week, but you know what place corresponds to today? Today is HaPoyre Sukkah Shalom Aleinu Be'al Kalam Yisrael Be'al Yerushalayim Shabbos is merely the day, it's Yerushalayim day. It's when the sanctity of Yerushalayim spreads to the seventh day of the week. It's the mitzvah that corresponds to Yerushalayim. And therefore we specifically pray, spread your canopy of peace upon us, and on Shabbos we add, and on Yerushalayim. And in L'chadoidi we make mention, restore the Beis HaMikdash. Don't be embarrassed, Yerushalayim. Today is your day. Today you will be rebuilt. How does God rebuild every Shabbos? God rebuilds Yerushalayim. A friend of mine mentioned to me, maybe that's why in Ritzay we say, Harinu Hashem, Nechom Asiyayim, Yiracha, Vivinyan Yerushalayim. So, may we all merit to see the Yom Shekul Shabbos, the Yom that's Yom Yerushalayim, the day, the era where the Kedushas Yerushalayim spreads. Lenetzach Netzachem, I thank you so much for joining me tonight. Rachel Hatzlacha, Ura'e, the two of you shine. Thank you so much.